Welcome to Beyond the Pod, presented by SodaStick.com. Brunette, he moves, Brunette back in, he scores! Minnesota has upset the Colorado Avalanche! Andrew Brunette, the game-winning goal! Here are your hosts, the second greatest scorer in Gopher hockey history, Pat Micheletti. And the second greatest hockey analyst on this podcast, Brandon Molesky. Yes, welcome to another episode of Beyond the Pod. Brandon Molesky from The Fan, Pat Micheletti, former Golden Gopher with me as well. Patrick, how you doing? We, uh, you know, after the, we get past the State Fair, it's time to start looking ahead to the next hockey season because it starts pretty quickly here. It's right around the corner. Uh, a little over a month away, if you can believe that, is is the, the first games. Um, yeah, where'd the summer go? But, uh, but you know what? You really start getting pumped up about it right now and, and excited about uh, the start of the season. There's reason to be excited in Mankato as well with the Minnesota State men's hockey team. Our, uh, the head coach of the Mavericks, Mike Hastings, joins us now. Mike, thanks so much for your time this morning. Really appreciate it. Uh, Pat knows I like to uh, ask really hard-hitting, controversial <laughs> questions right out of the gate. It is, it is my opinion that uh, the Mankato Mavericks have the best hockey uniform and jersey in all of college <laughs> hockey. Uh, I, I know you don't want to say your own team. So other than Mankato, who do you think has the best uh, – uniform jersey in all of college hockey boy that's a that's a pretty good call uh i've got to look at you know what i gotta go back to the alma mater i, I really like the black red and white st cloud i i like it um i'm old school uh yeah when, when we started to become fashionable was when i got out of the way of picking our jersey colors yeah all right that, that's when all of a sudden we started to pick it up a little bit so uh as you can tell it's it's uh it's it's the new age yeah, uh, the guys like the the changing of the colors and bright uh, seems to uh, resonate best, and we're proud of our colors, so it's good that we're wearing it. So, Brandon, I love you're on that uh, you're on that train. <laughs> well, I'm on the train too. I, I I don't know who designs them, but man, when when you guys present them every year, holy buckets, they look awfully sharp. Well, we appreciate it. You know what? We had our new president walk through our facility yesterday. Yeah, saw and, that. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we, we we talked about was was just trying to fly the flag and yeah. and be representative of what our university is, and we're proud of those colors, so we love to wear them. God, let's, let's, be, oh, go ahead, Brandon. I was just I was, I was gonna say, let's go back to last season, Mike. Um, obviously, a very successful regular season for you guys, and then uh, your first dip of uh, postseason success after having the you know the drought that I'm sure you've heard a million times about. I know ultimately. I know ultimately. You know, whatever. If you don't, if you don't win the whole thing, there's a little bit of disappointment. But I, but I have to imagine uh, to win that first NCAA game, especially in the dramatic fashion you did, and then to you know pretty much manhandle Minnesota in that second game, had to have been a pretty special uh, season for you. It was a great regional for us, you know, and and I thought we did a good job at, at finally getting over the hump. I'd tell you the truth in the first period and a half of the Quinnipiac <laughs> game, uh, I, I've seen that movie before. Yeah, and, and and so it was nice to uh, flip the script a little bit and make sure that we moved on and and had an opportunity to play Minnesota. And then I thought we put together one of our best sixty minutes uh, that we had on the year. So it was a it was a good opportunity for us to to I guess climb to a, a new height as a program. This group of seniors that left uh, have done us proud uh, with four league championships, and for them to be able to go out and leave the program progressing us to a new level, I think says a lot about them. And so we're excited about what we have in front of us. It's, it's good to break that piece of glass and hopefully we can just continue to climb. Okay. Last year's last year, but I, I got to ask you, um, do you look, what do you take from that St. Cloud game? I mean, was it, what, what did it come down to, you know, where, where, where did you think your team was at in that game? Um, and, you know, I mean, I mean, it ended up, it was, it was a great hockey game. Right. And uh, you know, you just, you know, fell a goal short. Yeah. I think experience is the best teacher and yeah. we hadn't had it. We hadn't been in that spot before. And so I thought we got off to a poor start. Yep. Uh, I thought we got our feet underneath us and, and played a really good second period. And I'll say the difference in that game was, a guy tipping a puck out of midair. Unbelievable. Yeah, and, you know, know what that was. And then you guys have been around the game long enough that when somebody makes a play against you that way at that time of the game, that's a difference in, in the end of the season. Yeah. Um, and you try to preach that now in August and September yeah. about, about what 
uh, one little play uh, can do and how it can impact either continue your season as we scored an overtime goal against Quinnipiac or how it can end your season like it did against St. Cloud. And I thought that was an absolute barn burner as far as a hockey game that we played against St. Cloud on both ends of that. I thought both teams took punches. Uh, both teams gave them. And I think you've got to give credit to St. Cloud for finding a way at that time of the game to make a play like that and finish us off. What's been kind of the message to your group this off season then preparing, you know, you, you, you had some success, you took the next step, you made some progress. What's been kind of your message to your program going into this season? I'll turn the page. You know, it's, it's, it's an opportunity for the group. You, you know, a lot of people haven't talked about it. Uh, us coaches always talk about the negatives. Uh, mm -hmm. You lose 11, you're bringing 10 in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a difference in your roster. And so we've, we, we, we had guys that were battle tested in that group of 11 that helped us achieve what we achieved a year ago. So they're no longer here. And then you're bringing in a group that's comprised of freshmen, some transfers, and then some guys that are going to be given the opportunity because they've earned it to be in different roles this year than they were a year ago. Yeah. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be a completely different team. Want to have the same mindset, but really just turn the page and move on that that book of history of an MSU hockey is now closed and we've got to start to write our own new chapter. Well, one guy that I want to talk about, and you know, I, I know you are a team concept guy and blah, blah, blah. And you know, all that, um, Nathan Smith. I mean, I, I think personally skill level wise, um, he's going to be a junior now. Uh, he, he may be one of the best forwards in the country. You know what? I, I agree with you. That's that's selfishly, but I've, I've watched his you know, maturation. Right? Yeah. Yeah. He's he's a guy that I think can make a difference on any team in the country. Yeah. And and when you start to talk about building your team in a top six, in a power play, in a penalty kill, uh, the maturation off the ice combined with the talent on the ice, uh, I'm hoping to just open the door and let him go play a little bit and look at the other guys and say, hey, you know what, follow that lead. And I thought he played his best hockey at the most important time of the yep. year. And I think that says a lot about a hockey player. And so he had an opportunity this year to sign with Winnipeg and chose to come back. He's he's in unbelievable shape. He's a little bit over 190 pounds right now, mm. uh, playing with a lot of confidence. And, and we're going to look to him often, uh, especially here early, to try and provide an example for our other guys to follow you know, isn't, isn't it interesting? You, you, you see a kid as a freshman, right? And wow, you know, you, you, you get that, you know, he dazzles you for a little, and I'm talking about anybody, but then, you know, a couple of years later, you know, you just mentioned, you know, I'm going to let him go a little bit more. Um, you know, it's that, it's that developing his body, you know, his mind, all of that. And, uh, you know, should be at a point where, you know, at this stage, guys like that should take off. Yeah, and they should, and we need him to with yeah. with the 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 guys that left up front, good five forwards that are moving on. Um, you know, I've got to stay out of his way, Mick. Is what I yeah. do. I got I got to allow him to go out and do what he does. Uh, just like at the end of last season, at that time, you're you're tweaking little things. You you are what you are at that time, and I think you saw his best. And we're hoping that's where he picks up. Yeah. Once we get out to UMass, when we start here in October. Hey, Mike, you're also going to have some changes to your coaching staff. Uh, Darren Blue, assistant coach, longtime assistant coach, been there for 21 years. He uh, he's uh, resigned. Um, I, I want to know, uh, you know, because typically when a new coach comes in, you think you kind of want your own staff and your own people you're comfortable with. Yet you retained him when he preceded your time there. So, what went into your decision to retain him, and and, and uh, you know, what what did he mean to the program? Brent, a great question. Uh, first of all, because I'm so thankful that that Darren and Todd decided to stay here. But if there's one guy I can give credit for that, it's Dean Blaze. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was leaving UNO, uh, was, I was walking out the door. He just said, "Hey, what are you what are you going to do with your staff?" And I said, y "You know what? I'm I'm not sure yet." And he goes, "Well, the new thing nowadays is guys going in and roaming and bringing their own guys in." He goes, "I know both of those young men," and you don't have to change your staff. Make sure you give them a chance, get to know them a little bit. That's exactly what I did. I had a little more history with Darren. 
yeah. uh, just because we're a little bit closer in age. And I'd learned by watching about Todd Connaught and what he's done in his career. And when I got here and spent the time that I did with him, I found out that they were not only really good hockey guys, but unbelievable human beings, great yeah. family men, people in the community. Uh, I gave Bluey a hard time for, for the first two years calling him the mayor of Mankato. <laughs> there, there wasn't anybody in town that didn't know Bluey. Yeah. And, and so they helped really, I think one of the reasons we were able to get on track as quick as we were, one, we had really good hockey players, which helps, <laughs> which helps all coaches. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then to the transition of them having a lay of the land here and the relationships that they had already built. So I was able to piggyback on that. And, and with Darren leaving their big, big, shoes to fill but with paul kirkland coming on I, i've been able to spend some significant time with him over the summer uh, and uh, just incredibly impressed every rock that i turned over asking about him as a hockey man and then just as or more importantly as a human being they they just kept coming up four stars so i'm really excited about it. we're going to miss bluey yeah uh, guys uh, the game of hockey is going to miss bluey yeah we're, we're, we're going to try and keep him around as much as we can because He's the fiber of what it is. And as I've said multiple times, he taught me what it is to be a Maverick. Um, so he's going to continue to be around, but we're excited about the, the new chapter and, and what we're going to write here in the next few years. Uh, new league, kind of, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Name change. Uh, a new commissioner, your former boss. Now, here's the funny, here's the question for you. You get a couple bad calls on a Friday night, right? <laughs> and I know, I, I know that you have his number in your phone. What are you going to say to him? Uh, I'm going to say to him, has Tommy Serratori called you yet? <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm going to say first. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, I knew you'd, yeah. Right, right. Because my <laughs> guess is he's going to make the phone call as I'm making the phone call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know what? It's it's one of those where sometimes guys with you two, I got to remember we're we're going to be seen by a few people. But yeah. uh, it's it's one where I'm excited about it for just the professional yeah. reasons uh, yeah. uh, of us taking a step. Uh, but that relationship is going to be unique. You, you've got Grandpa Tommy who helped him win a national championship right. at right. the University yep. of Minnesota. Yep. Uh, you've got Ty Eigner, who's a, a born and bred Minnesota guy from, from the start to where he's at now at Bowling Green. Yep. And Don's been around the game so long that he's just got a tremendous number of real solid relationships within our league. And as you know, Don's a professional and yep. he's going to be that way as the new commissioner. Yeah. Well, well let me, let me, let me tell you one thing, you know, uh, you know, we always see around the country, oh, um, you know, uh, the big 10. Uh, the NCHC, Hockey East. And, you know, in, in years past, um, the WCHA is kind of an afterthought. And which really bothers me because look at the teams that you put in to the tournament a year ago. But but I, what I like so far of what Don and and um, and, and Dom Hennig have, have, have done have, is really try to market the league. And, and, and to me, that's all you need to do because you know you you've proven it's a it's a good league, but you know it just hasn't been talked about enough. Well, and, and again, I, I I'm hoping I just looked through our schedule the other day again, fellas. And in, in our non-conference, we start with UMass, then we come back and play St. Cloud at the NCHC, go up to Duluth for the icebreaker, and then come back and and. I'll say this, the, the old days of, of maybe having a little bit of a soft, softer opponent in the old WCHA, yeah. it's gone. Right. And if you've ever gone into Michigan Tech, like uh, <laughs> we were up for that level five uh, coaching uh, clinic up in, in Duluth, Duluth, and all yeah. of us got together, and one of the questions that was asked is, what's one of the most intimidating places that you've had an opportunity to coach in? Yeah, and Tommy and I both said Michigan Tech. Yeah, uh, you know right. it, it's a it's a tough building, and not only that, uh, I'm going to say this: if you look at Tech, you look at Bemidji, who's you know beat I think it was Wisconsin in the tournament last year. Yeah, they've got a lot of their roster back. Tommy always does a great job at preparing his team. Uh, Michigan Tech, Bowling Green. Um, you, you look at Northern. I, I just there, there's not going to be a lot of easy outs, and yeah. so for us, we're hoping it continues to prepare us. For the end of the year 
Uh, because if you can get there and position yourself to get a ticket to the dance, you're going to be prepared once you get there. Yeah. You know, and, and let, let's talk about this upcoming year, you know, with, with COVID and, and the new NCAA rules allowing guys to come back. Um, that's going to make teams older, uh, a lot more mature. Um, this year could be one of the best years of college hockey. Do you agree? Well, it's, and again, you guys have been around a little bit. You, When you can retain your top end, when you can retain your experience, and then you bring in talent underneath that, that it's not the coaches that are teaching. It's the ones in the locker room. Yeah. And they can do it by example. And, and you compress that. And, and you have that group of guys with the returners that are coming back in all of college hockey. There's some teams that are retaining all of them. Uh, there's a good group that have lost the majority of them, but more or less you're seeing some of those high-end guys. We've got two guys, uh, you know, Reggie Lutz and, yeah. and Jack McNeely. They're, they're immediately part of our leadership group yeah. because of the experiences that they've had. And so uh, I do, I think, you know, guys, one of the best things, and I'm not talking about MSU, uh, I'm talking about college hockey. To see what just happened at Michigan <laughs> and have those first-rounders come back. Yeah. And, and, and literally by action, not words, say this is where we want to develop yeah. to get to the National Hockey League. I think that says all you need to hear about college hockey. When you have NHL teams investing in their prospects to go back and develop under Mel, his group, his coaching staff, uh, the Big Ten, uh, I, I just think that's a huge step for all of college hockey. Mick, you're right on the head of the nail. I think it's going to be an unbelievable season. And maybe another great addition to college hockey is there's another Minnesota team in uh, St. Thomas who you guys are going to play on uh, Hockey Day Minnesota at Blakesley Stadium. Uh, one, how did that come together in terms of picking your opponent? And um, I guess, is the community excited? Or how, it seems like uh, there's a lot of work and a lot that goes into putting that thing out there. So, But it's also great exposure for your program. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up because there's, again, a lot of people that do a lot of work behind the scenes. The local organizing committee here is knocking it out of the park as far as the community involvement, the corporate sponsorships, the investment that you're seeing away from the game. So the game that can go on, they're, they're, they're crushing that right now. So that that's a good piece because it allows us to get to where we need to get to, which is the game. Then when you ask about the opponent, uh, we go back to the commissioner, <laughs> the Utah. He, he just, <laughs> I'm not going to say he pushed, but he said, Hey, wouldn't it be a great idea if, uh, with St. Thomas coming into the league that uh, we could get you two together and dance on that day, um, in a celebration for the great state and the game that we play. And so, uh, talk to the athletic director at St. Thomas prior to them hiring a coach. And then as you guys know, Rico Blasi, you've had him on. Uh, he's very cordial at this time. I know he's not going to be as cordial <laughs> when the puck drops and he's trying to ruin our day here on hockey right. day. Uh, but from that standpoint, couldn't be more excited because the the community and you guys, you and I are from Northern Minnesota yep. and, and Brandon, I'm sorry. I don't know exactly. I'm from the Twin Cities. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's where I thought the state ended when I was growing up, you know, it was, it was the Northern part. It, to be down here and now be part of the fiber going on a decade, 10 years, we want to show ourselves for what we are. And it's progressed. It's gotten better. Uh, the, the, the fan base that we have down here, I think, is exceptional. And for us to add somebody like St. Thomas uh, to our league, I think it strengthens our league because yeah. those training wheels will be off in a hurry yeah. for St. Thomas because we all know what it's like to be in the Twin Cities. And, and what the draw is, uh, the academic, the social, the athletic. I mean, they're expected to be successful right away. So I think it's a great ad for our league, and I think it's a great opportunity to showcase what southern state of Minnesota can bring as far as hockey and the fan base that can follow it. So we're excited about showing off Hockey Day in Minnesota down here in Mankato. Uh, one final question for you, Mike. I asked this question to uh, Brett Larson, St. Cloud State, last week, and uh, – how has your uh, first experience with the transfer portal been? Oh, you know what, fellas? <laughs> <laughs> There's, uh, I'll, say, I'll be glad I shaved my head. Yeah. That's, that's a good thing, right? Uh, we're still learning. Uh, th those training wheels are on us. It's, you know, we've, we, we've benefited by a couple. We've had a couple of young men that came in and said, hey, you know what, coach, 
we want to go to a different program so we can have a little bit more of an opportunity. And you can't blame that uh, yeah. for young men when all he wants to do is get in the lineup. Yeah. Um, so I think it's going to be an evolution. It's it's one where I think if you live by that, uh, I, I think you could die by it. Um, mm-hmm. a, a lot of the programs, you guys have been involved in sports for a while. When you build your culture, I don't think it happens in a year. I, you know, we've had a few transfers come in and they've done a great job. Todd Burgess came in, signed a contract uh, after his season, but nine months does not make a career. Yeah. And and so I think we'll continue to dabble in it both ways because I think you have to. Yeah. Um, but I don't want it to end up being the core group of what we have on a yearly basis because of what we've been doing. We've been going in a good direction. We want to maintain our culture. And the only way to do that is, I think, have people – have the players teach each other, not the coaches teaching the players. And yep. if we can do that, maybe we can sustain some success. Mike, really appreciate your time. Look forward to chatting with you down the line. All Take right, care, guys. Michael. Take care. Thank yep. you. All the best to you. Yeah, All right, you too. Thanks, Mike. Take care. All right. Mike Hastings, head coach of the Minnesota State Mankato Mavericks. Before I chat with you again, Pat, let's talk about uh, sodastick.com. Go to sodastick.com. Get your original Minnesota sports-inspired goods. If you haven't seen this stuff yet, you got to check it out. One of my favorite designs, I'm wearing it right now, the North State hat. All of their apparel is screen printed here in Minnesota on super soft, super comfy shirts. You will love it, and we're going to hook you up with 15% off your next order. So use the code KFAN for 15% off. That is sodastick.com. Original Minnesota sports-inspired goods. Use the code KFAN for 15% off your next order. Brandon, I've you've, you've heard me say this probably a million times. Yeah. We are so lucky in this state to have the coaches that we do at no the college doubt. level. I mean, all great people, all care about the kids um, and run really good programs. We're, we're really lucky. Well, not only that, but uh, in terms of from a media standpoint, Pat, in terms yeah. of having them on the radio, having them on television, you know, we, we've, we've always loved having Mots go on and obviously yep. we're giving him a little space at this time, yep. given that situation. But Brett Larson's great at St. Cloud. Hastings. We haven't had Saratori on yet, but no. he's a he's a hoot up in Bemidji. Yeah. Uh Sandlin obviously has had a ton of success up in Duluth. And uh we got we got a sixth program on the yeah, way and we'll we'll go. see what happens yep. at St. Thomas. But uh man, the hockey is good here. Yeah. There's a yeah. there's a reason they call it the state of hockey, Pat. Great point. Great point. Yep. You know, it's funny. Um Mike brought up something I was gonna bring up with you, and the, that's the fact that uh, you know, kind of the three three of the big guns at Michigan that were all drafted in the top five of the NHL draft, Owen Power, who went number one overall uh, to Buffalo, Matt Beneers, uh went to Seattle, yeah, Kent, Kent, Kent Johnson, uh, all deciding they're going to return to Michigan this year. And in terms of uh, Big Ten play, there's, you know, obviously the game of hockey, you know, things happen, there's injuries, there's a, there's a chemistry and a uh, you know, teams that play for each other that come into play as you progress throughout a season. Yep. Teams, that, teams that can learn to play as a team. But in terms of just pure talent to have those guys coming back for a second year, uh, that, that should be a team to be reckoned with. Well, no doubt about it. And that's that's why I brought it up to um, Mike about Nathan Smith and, and seeing him dazzle a little bit as a freshman and where he will be now as a junior. And we can't forget that. Let, let, let's not forget those guys were drafted in the first round based on on their talent and where they hope to get to, right? Um, so no doubt about it. I mean, you know, great players, great talents, but, you know, it, it, it doesn't necessarily me- mean, hey, Michigan, Michigan's going to win the national championship. I mean, there's a maturity uh, level that, that – you know, still needs to build. Will they get there? Do they have the potential to get there this year? No doubt about it. I mean, just, you know, based on having seven number one draft picks in their lineup. Um, but that doesn't guarantee anything. And and uh, and the the years of maturing um, uh, really play an effect uh, on it too. And, and, you know, so, you know, we'll see. It's it, like, like you said, it's going to be a great year. Let's talk about that Minnesota State program then in terms of what you project for this season for that team as as you know Mike mentioned you know they were kind of building to the point where they had a yep. chance to win the whole thing last year and man after that after that game against the Gophers in the NCAA tournament I, I watched that game and thought this team is winning the whole thing but obviously great competition in that frozen four uh, and, and you also had that two week stretch but you know you do lose half the team uh, this happens quite a bit in college hockey yeah. where you build you build up and you want your older players 
being your best players at a certain time and filling in with the younger players, uh, how quickly can they reload? I would still imagine, though, in the conference they're in, that you know they have a shot to win that thing. Well, I do, and and you know, it's it starts with their goaltender. You know, yeah. they get dried McKay back, and if you have a goaltender to to that has done what he has done, I think he'll break uh, uh, Miller's record this year of of uh, shutouts. Um, and and then you look at a kid like Ryan Sandlin, right? He's a kid who didn't play a lot early in the year, fourth line, third line, but really came into his zone uh, at the tournament. And now that is a guy that should fill a role, that should be able to take that next step. Um, he mentioned Reggie Lutz um, gets to come back, you know, when, you know, so they are losing some people, but they'll have guys stepping up. They'll have guys maturing and, and some really good players that are going to have to fill those spots. Um, and I, you know, I think they will be, you know, obviously, you know, a top five team entering uh, the season. Yeah. Always nice too. As you mentioned, if you're going to lose some players to have your goalie come back, who was the yep. WCHA player of the year last year, uh, that can, that can calm some things and, and gain some confidence. Maybe as you have some bumps in the road moving forward, uh, Wild, it's it's our weekly uh, Karoka yeah. Precept discussion. You know, it's kind of funny, Pat. I said from the get-go that I was never worried about him going to the KHL. I always thought he was signed. My biggest concern was what's going to be the term of the contract? How, right. how long is he going to sign for? If it's three years or less, that doesn't do anything for me because that means we're going to have to be in a position where we got to trade him in, in the coming, uh, you know, in the coming years. Yeah. Uh, it does, at least according to a report from Michael Russo, KHL is is not going to happen. And that they are making some headway, or at least they're still communicating. Uh, it's, so at this point, Pat, it's a matter of something's going to get done. It's not a matter of if; it's when. But still, it's it's the money and and the term that's going to be, I think, what's going to determine how great we feel about this. Brandon, you and I have been saying from day one, um, and especially after that report came out that Kevin Weeks leaked, um, that he's going to be here. Um, and we said that for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we believe that, and, and I think he believes this, that he wants to be a top five. He wants to be the best player in the world. Um, and he's not going to be the best player in the world playing in the KHL. Yeah. Um, his teammates love him. Uh, the fans here did not get a real good chance to see him. Um, I think he would like to experience that and, and feel that love from the Minnesota fans who absolutely, you know, adore the kid. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you're driven like that as an athlete, um, you know, there, he knows ultimately where he wants to be. So that being said, the whole hang up with this contract is not money. It's term because of his ability to get to free agency and you can't blame his agent. You can't be mad at his agent for wanting a two year deal so he can get to free agency and really cope. that's so much confidence that the agent has in the player. And that's so much confidence the player has in himself because he knows his next payday is the big payday. Um, and you can't blame Minnesota for wanting that longer contract. Um, so ultimately you know, I think cooler heads will prevail um, and they will get something that is fair for the player and fair for the organization. Uh, you know, it, it uh, you know, it, it just with great athletes, it takes time. Some other good news for the wild, their first round draft pick from last year, Marco Rossi back <laughs> playing again. He was uh, playing in the Olympic qualifiers for Austria. You know, Pat, I'm not, I'm not watching the game. Obviously you just nope. see, you see Twitter highlights. So it, you, you take it with a grain of salt. That being said, he had a great snipe on a power play goal. I don't know if it was a penalty shot or a shootout of some sort, but he had a nice, you know, kind of Peter Forsberg like Deke. Either way, great for him after the year he's had just to be on the ice playing in, the, in those situations. And I, I have to imagine that's that's a great preparation for him before he gets to wild training camp. I'm calling it right now, Brandon, and and I I, I called it last year because we asked Dean Evison, is there a spot for Marco Rossi? And he said, you know what? Yeah, he comes in and shows, you know, yeah, there's a spot for him. I'm going to say this right now. He is going to be on this team. This team needs help 
up the middle. Now, he may not light it up right away because, you know what? It's the National Hockey League, and yeah. you're a rookie, and you're a rookie. No other reason. Not COVID, not, not missing a year. Um, when you get drafted in the top 10, he went eighth um, overall. Uh, he's driven. You and I have talked to him, and, you know, just talking to him, you wanted to um, – uh, get back on the ice yourself. Right. And, and he will be prepared. He will be ready. And, um, I think, uh, you know, get rid of the noise where, well, you know, you, you, you hear it from the team and you hear it from the fans and you hear it from the media. Um, oh, it needs time, this, that I think the kid will be ready day one. And I think he will be on this team. Well, we, I think we definitely know he'll be driven and he'll work hard. Like he'll, yeah. he'll, he'll put himself in the best chance yeah. To make that, that opening day roster. And Pat, you know, we, we talk quite a bit about our top six, you know, splitting up Kaprizov and Fiala and, and Kaprizov can play with Zuccarello because they think alike. And after that, I don't I don't really know if there's a player on the roster that can kind of think the way Fiala thinks the game. And don't know if Rossi is going to be ready right out of the way. You know, and as you mentioned, it's hard for a rookie to just jump in the National Hockey League. But at least that's a prospect that can think – from a playmaking, offensive-minded standpoint. He's also great defensively in his own end and, and all that stuff. But um, in terms of s- someone that can think the game that way, he is that player. And and here's here's what I'd like to see them do. I'd like to see him center Kaprizov and Zuccarello. Yeah. For a couple reasons. Not to say, oh, here's our number one center. Don't label him that number one center. But, you know, eventually he will be once he gets to the point sure. where he's acclimated and all that but to take a little of the um, stress off of them. When you're playing with great players, they make you look a lot better. Trust oh, yeah. me. You know? <laughs> you know and- Why do you think I do the hockey podcast with you? You make me look a lot better. Mm, I was I was just going to say the same thing, <laughs> which, is, which is really true. Um, but, but no, I, I, I really think that, you know, it. listen, he's a smart – he wouldn't have been a number one pick, number eight overall pick – if he wasn't a smart player, if he didn't have the skill level and on and on and on and on. So you put him with some really good players who can help him along. I think it'll, I think that would, uh, I, I'm anxious to see it. I think he went nine overall and I still don't know why Buffalo, I I still don't know why Buffalo didn't take him at number eight, but I guess it's still to be determined. We haven't, he hasn't, right. Yeah, but he hasn't done anything yet. So he, he hasn't proven it yet. So maybe maybe I'll be proven wrong. But I think that was a a great pick by the Minnesota Wild. Is the, uh, Eichel, Pat, is the Eichel talk over? With I, I don't – between Eichel and Ben Simmons in the NBA, I, I don't know what's I going know, on with, right? these, with these guys that are demanding trades and no one's moving them. Right. But, uh, Pat, I will uh, chat with you at some point next week. I have no idea because I'll be at the State Fair every day. Maybe we'll find an evening to do it. Uh, maybe we'll have Kaprizov breaking news at some point. We can do a night show and – and uh, Brandon, we'll, we'll, podcast, we'll play by ear. This podcast is not about me. It's about you. No, it's not about me. It's I about us. Will I will it's, whatever you need? I will do. Pat, it's about us. It's not about me. It's We're not about you. It's not about me. It's about us. No, no, I and team. Have All a right. great day. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate it. He's Pat Micheletti. I'm Brandon Molesky. This has been another episode of Beyond the Pod, brought to you by Sodasick.com. Make sure you use that code KFAN for fifteen percent off. We'll talk to you next week, right here on Beyond the Pod. Bye.